um, in a church. What do you think a church should be? I mean, really, a church should be, in my opinion, and what I get out of the Bible, a church should be the reflection of Jesus Christ. So what would Jesus do if he, if he was here um, in a group of people meeting two or three times a week? What do you think he would be doing? And I think that Jesus would be using every resource that he has to reach the lost and lead them to salvation. I, I, I think that's it. But, and I don't think he would use the resource of um, just pointing the finger at people. I think he would use the resource of showing how much love he has and how much he cares for them. Now, that when I read the Bible, there's a few things that hinders people from doing some of this stuff especially for a church. One of the things, probably the number one reason that people really don't do what the church should be doing is because they're small in number. I mean, literally, look at our group of people. We're small in number. That should deter us from doing anything because there's not enough people. And if we said, okay, well, we're, we're, we'll just do what, with what we have. Well, some of you have back injuries. Some of you have knee injuries. Some of you have, um, no, I wasn't looking at you. <laughs> I saw you turn to mom. <laughs> oh, okay, and both, that's good. I like that. See, you should tell me so I can use this stuff in my sermon. Um, some of us have um, the things that we, we're not capable. So even though there's a small group, we're even smaller by people who actually may have the physical abilities to do some of the leg work and uh, muscle that it takes to do some of these things. So then that eliminates them. That financially, we're not financially strong. Our bank account has um, enough money in it to pay our bills maybe for this month. Um, so financially, we shouldn't be able to do anything. That changes the dynamics of many churches today. They think, well, we can't do it. We don't have enough people, and the people we do have aren't capable of doing it, and we don't have enough money. Another thing that um, really hits me is when we hear the people in the church that can't decide what they want to do because it's not effective. One of the things that people tell me about our ministry is, well, people don't come to our church after they get saved at our events. So what do you do with that? Do you really just say, okay, well, since they're not going to come here, then I'm not going to try. You know, um, at our district uh, assembly, it was a great statement that was made was, um, we need to ask people to be saved. We literally need to start asking people about salvation. And our, um, it's tough, especially in our day and time, because of, you can be any religion, just don't be Christian. Because if you say you're a Christian, your friends, family, uh, employees, uh, employers will just turn, turn from you. One of the illustrations today was used by um, the spokesperson for Point Loma. And he said his son went to a different college because Point Loma didn't offer the classes that he was taking. So he went to another college, and it was a secular college. And the, the teacher, the professor in that class, the very first day said this, do not mention God in my class or you will fail. If you need to depend on God, then you are weak and you are not made for this class, therefore I will not pass you. So if you're going to mention God in this class, you might as well leave now. So the son called his dad up and goes, dad, what do I do? And dad goes, well, you got two choices. You can stay in the class and not mention God, or you can leave the class. And the son decided just to leave the class and to not take that class. And through doing that, he avoided the whole confrontation of, hey, this is what I believe, um, and I believe is right. And she's strangling him, basically, and saying that no one in that class can mention God. There's probably a lot of legal issues with that. Um, we have freedom of speech. Um, she's not anywhere 
and the right to take that away. And, um, and right of religion, we have that right. However, he, he wasn't going to fight that battle. He just wanted to get his degree. And sure enough, he did. And now he's doing um, greater things because he just avoided that whole thing. But look at where we are in our ministry. That's what people want us to do. They don't want us to mention God. They don't want us to mention how to be saved. They don't want us to get up and do what we're supposed to be doing. Well, here's um, another question that came up. Um, have you started a conversation with anybody about being saved? Have we actually asked our friends about it? One of the number one things that kids of uh, Western High School here, um, one of the kids got killed um, uh, on a bike or motorcycle or bike crash, and all the kids were sad. And, you know, they're in tears. The entire school is upset because this young man lost his life. And so the Christians that come to this church, I asked him, I said, so have you ever mentioned Jesus to him? No. Then we need to cry. We really do need those tears because we missed an opportunity of rescuing a person from eternal death. Now you start thinking about this and you start changing it a little. You know what? If you don't mention to your friends about Jesus Christ, who's going to? Who's going to reach them? You say, well, uh, oh, they, they can see it in me. They can see that I'm a Christian, so they would ask. No, you know what? There's so many people that just need to be asked. I used to take a sales class uh, cause when I was in real estate. And one of the techniques for selling um, a, any, any item one of the techniques is that after you tell them about your product you ask them how many they want to purchase and then you stop talking the game winner is this the next person that speaks owns the product. This is what he means. You tell them what you have. You talk to them and you tell them, I have the best car wax um, in the nation. And this is what it does. It'll take um, your car and make it look like it's brand new. And um, if it doesn't, I guarantee that, um, that uh, we'll, we'll take it back 100% guaranteed. How many bottles would you like? Now there's this nervousness right there where that silence. And it's the next person that speaks goes home with that bottle of wax. If the salesperson says, oh, 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 oh well, um, you know, and also what it does is it also um, will, will work on your van and it also will work in your house. And you know what? He spoke. He said too much. He's already told how good the product is. And now all of a sudden he's overselling it. He's asked him the question. Now he's messed up the question. And now he's talking about more stuff. It's like do the sales pitch, ask the question, be quiet. If the person on the other end says, well, will it really work? The salesperson can relax because that person has just became interested in what the person's selling because they spoke and they're involved. They just bought into the conversation. Once they bought into the conversation, they're going home with that product. In Christian life, now I'm not saying do a sales pitch on someone in the same sense. You don't need to. But what we need to do sometimes is don't think we can just show. We need to express what Jesus does. But guess what? You need to ask the question and then shut up. My daughter looks at me every time I say that word. <laughs> you said shut up. When you are with your friends and with your families, you know what? Here's the deal. 
Tell them about what Jesus has done in your life. Show them what Jesus has done. You say, well, they see it in me. They see what I do every day. Absolutely. You are showing them what Jesus has done in your life. And man, you should hold on to that and show everybody. But let me tell you something. As in the sales presentation, you need to ask the question. Otherwise, they don't know what to do with it. Okay, so you told me how good the product is. What are you going to do? Display it somewhere? No, I want you to buy it. Well, you've been showing Jesus to your friends for years. You've been showing them that you don't cuss, you don't lie, you don't cheat, you don't steal. You do, uh, you do all these great things and you're a wonderful person. And man, how your life has changed. You can go through um, th um, life events and still praise God and thank him even though your life is upside down. How do you do it? You know, they've seen it in you. You know what? It's time. It's time to turn to your friend and say, would you like to have a relationship with Jesus just like I do? Now be quiet. Let them think about that. You don't have to keep telling them and telling them. It's like, you know what? Just ask the question. That's the only thing. You don't have to harass them. You don't have to keep telling them how bad their life is. You don't need to go into the um, ABCs of um, what this means. All you need to do is really just present it to them. Man, my life has been so changed because of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you like that same thing in your life and then be done? Um, one of the things that um, happens to us is the what does it mean to be a Christian? A lot of people in churches still have that problem. They don't know what it means. Does it mean that I can't cuss, lie, cheat, and still? Well, you know what? Let's get to the basics of it, and let's go by what does, how do you please God? That's really what it comes down to. God created us, and he has a plan for us. Well, what makes us? do the things or what uh, makes us make him happy what what are the things that we're doing that we can do right in our life that is right in his eyes so that's what we call righteousness righteousness is living the way that he sees as righteous because he is righteous so in god's eyes he he knows what is righteous he knows what is love. He is love, right? So he is righteous. He is love. So let's look to the Father and say, well, that's why we have God's word. And God's word tells us that we cannot please God without one thing, faith. If you do not have faith, you cannot please God. You know what? All you need to do is express to your friends if they'll have faith in Jesus Christ, if they'll just have faith, that's the beginning of a relationship. In, um, in Romans 4, Paul is writing and he says this. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. It was righteousness because Abraham committed to God in faith. He believed God. He had faith in God. You know, I... Sometimes we get so caught up in what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do that the church is so afraid to go out and preach the gospel and teach people because we're afraid of what it's going to do. First of all, we need to wake up as a church. We obviously are doing so many right things, but we're not there yet. We are doing evangelism probably better than any small group of people can. I mean, just the, the number of people that we reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ is impossible with a group like us we're too small in number but it's not impossible with God and that's because we have another type of faith there's two types of faith one is um, a saving faith which is the faith that we believe in Jesus Christ and the second faith is to have faith in him that he's gonna provide what you need to go get the job done that he's called you to do he's called us to reach the lost and we go out and we reach the lost why because he's empowering us to go out and do that by this, um, by these two types of faith, 
I want you to understand something. There is one type of faith that you need to be saved by. There's nothing, absolutely nothing you can do. And that's what Paul is referring to, is saying that it's not by your works that you're saved. You are not so good in your abilities and the things that you're doing that you have somehow just broken all odds and have done such a good thing in your life that you are worthy of God to look down on you and say, Woo, man, you've done it. You've defeated sin. You're perfect. And it's all because of some way you figured out you, you did it. You put all the numbers together and they added up to perfection. No, it, it, you know what? The Bible says there's nothing by what you've done. It's by your faith in God of something he's already done. It's through faith that you know that because Jesus died on that cross and was laid into the grave and then rose from the grave that you are saved. So it's through faith, not by anything that you have. James is saying something, and I know that when you hear a story about faith, they always talk about Paul and James and the controversial, um, the way that people read it think it's a little controversial but it's not and most scholars and m most pastors um, understand this it's usually lay people that um, haven't studied the bible enough they don't understand these differences in faith so that's why we bring it out a lot because we don't we don't want people to think that there was a difference between what paul was saying and what um and what james is saying because it sounds like they're contradicting each other but you need to realize there's two types of faith paul was talking about saving faith James here is going to be talking about a different faith, and this is what he says in James um, 2.20, I believe, if I can find that. It says, but, um, yeah, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Other translations say um, without, uh, faith without works is dead. If you, um, if you do work, to be saved, it's not going to happen. You're going to still be unsaved. It takes faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. That's what Paul is saying. James is saying, if you have faith in God and you're not doing any work, your faith is useless. What good is it for the church? And this is going back to what I was saying originally. What good is it if we're going to sit here and say, well, I'm not sure that those people that come out to our concerts and accept Jesus Christ are going to continue believing. I'm not sure if they're going to go to church and get discipled. I'm not sure they're going to read their Bible. I'm not sure if this is even worth it. Um, how is it. We don't have enough money to spend on giving people toys and food. And, and how do we know it's going to pay off? You know what, if our mindset is so closed that we don't express our faith by works, here's how you do that. You do what we're doing and then some more. No, we don't have enough money. But if I believe that Jesus Christ saved me from my sins and that that same Jesus gave us a commandment to go into all the world and that same Jesus told his disciples to leave behind their money bags and to go into towns and to preach the gospel with nothing, not to even charge for it, then that God, I must have that same faith to say that that God has a plan to provide for my needs as I go from town to town, from ministry to ministry, from place to place. I must know by faith. So what? I am, I am saved by faith. But now that I'm saved by faith and I see the power of my God, then I must do step number two. I must now work that faith and show that, you know what? It's through faith that I'm saved, but it's through faith that I can accomplish all the things that need to be accomplished um, of what God's calling us to do. And that's to reach the lost. There's a reason that this small ministry has reached 21,000 people or more. Actually, it's, it's more than that. And that's because of faith, continual faith. And we've said, yes, it, it's impossible to do what we're doing. It's impossible the fact that last week um, we were giving away toys that we couldn't afford. Do you know if you put a dollar amount on the amount of toys that we gave away, we gave away thousands of dollars worth of toys. So each toy was $50. Can you imagine um, the amount of toys um, uh, for 
how many we gave away, and then how many more we're going to give away. Can we afford that? No. But you know what God did? God sent us a semi-truck full of toys. So we're good. When you read Paul and you read James, um, what they're writing here, the church needs to come alive and first know that your friends and your family can be saved if they'll just have faith in Jesus Christ. And let's don't make it more complicated than that. They said today, the church of the Nazarene has one real mission, one real purpose. Every church has a purpose. Um, and they, they should. I mean, the churches that are defined and what they're doing, what their calling is. The reason you would start a church is because you have a point, you have a purpose, and God's called you to do that. Um, Baptist, for one, um, Baptist had a purpose. Um, uh, baptism is one of their number one purposes. They believe um, in teach, the teaching of the gospel and then baptize, making sure people are baptized in their salvation. Um, Pentecostal and um, others uh, have um, speaking the gifts, speaking in tongues especially, and other gifts, and they have that, um, they really believe that they need to teach that people need to speak in tongues and, and have these gifts. So you have these, and then the Church of the Nazarene has holiness. We truly um, feel it, believe it, have taught it, that God expects holiness, a holy people. Uh, Peter says it would, um, quoting um, the scripture, is uh, be holy for I am holy. And um, what does that mean? Are we just supposed to read right over that and say, oh, that wasn't in there? No, there's a purpose for that. Because we need, and the Church of the Nazarene says, um, their mission is to teach that. Well, like they were saying at District Assembly today, how can you teach people to be holy unless first you get them saved? So we need to go back to the basics. And um, I see us as already there. I see us as already evangelizing. I see us as reaching into the community. But I, I think we can get caught up in that. And that's all we do is evangelize, evangelize. And in the same place, the same spot, we need to say, okay, what more is God calling us to do? We can't stay in that same spot. So we need to reach people with the gospel. Okay, let's reach them with the gospel. Yes, we know that there is a holy living. We know that. But what good is it to teach people how to live holy if they haven't accepted Christ yet? The whole point is there's two works of salvation. I mean, uh, um, two works of the Spirit, I should say. Um, the first one is salvation. The second one is when you have that encounter with God as a Christian, and then you're serious. There's a lot of Christians that still have anger inside of them. They still have um, different um, fleshly desires inside of them and they fight with that constantly they're trying to live for god and at the same time their flesh wants them to go back to doing the things they used to do um, that fleshly battle is continual until the holy spirit cleanses your heart and that's what the holiness de um, denominations and teachings are about it's let's work towards having that encounter with god where you as a christian go back to god and say you save me and I want to be more like you, but I found out I can't do it on my own. There's Just like Paul was saying, it's not by your works that you were saved. Well, it's also not by your works that you're going to be entirely sanctified. There's nothing that you can do in all your ability to cleanse your heart. It has that sin nature in there. It's just part of when you were born, you got it. It's the curse from when Adam and Eve sinned. You can't get rid of it. Um, but the one that can cleanse you and uh, get rid of that, that sin nature that we call it, um, the one that can do that is the Holy Spirit, and he can cleanse your heart. You say, well, how do I stop sinning? You know, here's the key. You go and you kneel down before God, and you say, God, I, I, you forgave me for my sins, but I continue to get wrapped up in this. And you say, cleanse me take it away you're not sinning just because you're sinning you're sinning because there's a root of that sin that root of that sin is that 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 thing that makes it a desirous thing i'll give you an example with i'm um, smoking and i'm not saying that people that smoke go to hell i just think smoking's bad but smoking is a habit that people think they have to have and they can't stop and if you've ever sp spoken to a, a person that stops smoking They've just said, you know what, I'm done with it, and they've stopped. They finally beat the habit. Smoking, people that are smoking around them makes them nauseous. 
They can't even figure out why people do it. And in fact, the, the biggest advocates of smoking are people that used to smoke and have stopped. The same thing, um, in a sense, um, except this is where God comes in and cleans you. He turns that to where you actually get nauseous at the thought of those sins that you used to do. That's a good change. When the things that you desire in your fleshly desires, God enters into your heart, cleans it out, and then you don't have those desires. In fact, it makes you sick. You know why it makes you sick? Because when you cleanse, when you're cleansed and you have a righteous living, you know that the Bible talks about God hates sin and we want to be like God? Well, he cleanses our heart and makes us more like him. And guess what? Well, the result is we also hate sin. Do you know how close you're getting to God? See how much you hate sin. The closer you get to God, the more you're in a relationship with him, the more you hate sin. The desire for sin goes away, and the more you want to do things that are righteous and things that are right in God's eyes. What did it have to do with you? You know, um, we keep saying there's nothing that you've done, nothing you've done, and, and, and that is absolutely true. You didn't cleanse your heart. You didn't do the works to be saved. God took care of all that. Now, that's actually the technical part of it. Jesus died on the cross. He rose from the dead. You didn't do any of that. He paid the price. You didn't do any of that. Here's the, there is a relationship part. It doesn't save you in the sense of you did anything to deserve it, but it is something that the Savior says you have to do. So um, just for you to play a role in this, you must ask for forgiveness, repent. You must do that. And you must keep his commandments. So whenever people talk about faith, Yes, faith in Jesus Christ. Once you do that and you accept Christ in your life, he says, keep my commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. Put God first, and there's nothing to be above God. And that means family. That means money. That means your job. That means sports. That means activities. That means nothing is to be um, higher than God. God is to be number one in your life. And then it, it should be your family. And then um, your, your, obviously um, your neighbor um, falls in that category. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's everybody. Love people. And then below that is all your activities and things. You just have an order of, of things. When you have that relationship with God, you will start to hate those sins that you used to do. There won't be a desire to go back and do them anymore. Now with that said, listen to this if you can keep that in your mind we don't have to scare our friends and family away from being christian we don't have to go around pointing the finger at them so much you know i point the finger at christians and i do that um, in my preaching i very seldom knowingly point out the sins of a sinner on like i'm joking around or or whatever as far as i'm trying to get them safe now with a christian i do because um we are to Talk to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let them know what they're doing. Um, uh, and, and it could be jokingly or however you do it. I find a good way to joke about things and um, to bring it to their attention. Because if the Bible says that we shouldn't do it, let's make sure that's what the fellowship's all about. We kind of got each other's back. We watch each other. Hey, you know what? That doesn't um, really match what God's word is saying. So I do that on Facebook. When I see you guys post stuff on Facebook that's not right, I just slam you. One person last week, I put a bunch of question marks after they had made some strange comment. If you ever get question marks from me, <laughs> it, it means that I don't want to say what I want to say. I'm just going to be nice and put question marks. Like, what? <laughs> Did you just say that? <laughs> in our walk with God, let's bring the gospel of Jesus Christ in a loving Jesus way. You know what? The greatest thing is show them what's happened in your life and then ask them if they would like to accept Jesus. Your friends will go to hell if they don't accept Jesus. Think about that. I was studying about hell um, a few times, but I really studied a little bit more um, in the past weeks. And in the Bible, there's um, different words that's used for hell and it describes different places. And um, there is, and the Catholics try to use a waiting place, like if you've sinned, um, the Catholics teach about purgatory, and you can go there and try to earn your rights again. That's not this place that I'm about to describe, but that's the Catholic teaching. The biblical teaching is there's actually a place that um, sinners go, and it's not the ultimate place. It's not um, the lake of fire. 
and it, um, this is Hades, um, they call it Shiloh or Hades, and that's a place that the rich man, when Jesus told the story, the rich man and Lazarus um, told that story, that's where he was. Jesus, when Jesus preached the gospel, um, remember, to the people of Noah's time, that he was in this waiting area. What are they waiting for? They're like in a waiting room. It's not a nice waiting room. It's worse than being in the emergency room. This waiting place is where um, the rich man described it as it was so hot, it was burning his tongue, um, the heat, uh, but it's not the, um, obviously it's not the flames that they're going to get when they get in the lake of fire, but the intense heat is there. And we don't really understand all the um, technical stuff of how this works as far as what hell is really going to be like, but Jesus explained. Jesus is the one person in the, the entire Bible, Jesus explained more about hell than the entire Bible put together. Jesus um, spoke more about hell than anybody else, and he described it and gave us the insights to hell. But when Jesus died, remember it says that he went down and um, talked to the ones and preached to the ones of Noah's day. So that's where they're waiting. Your friends and family that don't know Jesus Christ, that's where they're going to go. Now here's the one thing that we have to get right. It hurts, especially if you're a teenager and you're in high school or college. Um, you're living in a worse time than I lived in. I didn't have this problem. Um, the generation before me didn't have this problem. Uh, if you go in and talk about Jesus being the only way to heaven, they are really going to smash you. Um, but here's the thing. If you waver in your faith, your friends and family will not hear the truth. If they don't hear it from you, they probably won't hear it from anybody else. Jesus is the only way to heaven. You need to, you as a church, as a Christian, as someone who has put their faith and their life in this man named Jesus. You didn't do it because you thought it was a good fairy tale story. You didn't put your life and your family life and the, the fact that when you die, you're going to be with Jesus. You didn't do that because you, um, you thought, oh, that sounds good. You did it because you really believe that Jesus and the Bible is absolutely true. Well, if you believe that, when somebody contradicts you, that's great. That's a wonderful opinion of what they have. You know what? You can have that opinion, but I know what I know. So I'm going to tell you what I know because of this. If I leave and you haven't heard the gospel and you die, I may be the last person that was going to tell you. I may be the one person that God has sent to tell you about him because the whole world wants to tell you that everybody's going to heaven. You heard that? Everybody's going to heaven. Really? Then Jesus must be a big fat liar. Because Jesus talks a lot about hell and about how people are going to go there. He gives illustration out of illustration of how people will, are not ready. God, um, it, oh, Jesus, a God um, they're talking about when they get to heaven, and God is going to say, I never knew you. Who is he not going to know? If every one of us are going to go to heaven, then who's God going to say, I don't know? <laughs> no. And he talks about casting them out. Who is he casting them out? So their amazing ability to have this fascination with the afterlife is it's a great thing take it to disney disney could make a good tv show out of it or take it to um, somebody else who has this um uh, this whole make-believe world but let me tell you something the bible says that god will say i never knew you and he'll cast them out with that said and jesus saying while i was on earth here saying that they're going to separate what, the sheep from the goats, given an illustration of two different types, the wheat from the tares, the, taking the bad and the good, continuing those illustrations. Well, if everyone is going to heaven, why in the world would Jesus spend so much time talking about they're going to be separating people and casting them into the fire? If everybody was going to heaven, Jesus could just have left those sermons out and been done with it because if everybody's going, then he didn't have to really do anything to say anything. Die on the cross, raise from the dead, everybody's good. But the truth is that Jesus knows. They were talking about something yesterday that really just should burn in our hearts. The Bible talks about 
that it is so important to save that one. You know the story of the 99 and then the one, got, one went out and that the shepherd would leave, would leave uh, the 99 and go out to get the one because that one is so important. Could you imagine if you just saved one of your friends from going to hell? The Mormons have an interesting thought. They have a whole book on how um, when you leave this world that you're going to be um, a god of another universe. Man, I, I, that would be so cool. Too bad it's not real. Some man wrote a book and convinced so many people that after they go here, they get to be like Jesus in a, in a godly way and have their own universe and go around and control all the things that goes on. And, you get, and, if, you, and if you're not good enough, it's okay because you can be that person's angel. Oh, that sounds good. And it's what people want to hear. They want to hear that they're going to go beyond this. And it's like, um, you know what? We're tired of hearing the whole Jesus thing. We want something of our own. Make it up. And that's what he did. And you know, right now, he is in that part of hell called Hades that's waiting for judgment day. But you know, in his Hades, where he's at, there's the torture and the torment. And you know, whenever we, the Bible talks about the rich man remember it says that his tongue was burning and um you can use that probably as a spiritual burning because it was probably his tongue that was part of a lot of his sin the fire was burning and it's that part of the um, man that created that wrote the mormon book um you can just imagine as he's in hell that his punishment is probably if I just and now this is not biblical this is just the way that I perceive I believe that your torment during this time is to see how many people are going to be lost because of something that you've done and the pain and the agony that you have to go through as you see each one of them cast into hell can you imagine him being in hell and being tortured and tormented by every single Mormon that is going to lose their life and go to hell because they were taught a false doctrine and they fell for it here's what the false doctrine will do to you the false doctrine is if you do not know that Jesus is God the Bible says that every knee is going to bow and confess that Jesus is Lord. That l word Lord is the um, translation from to, into our English, but that is God. God. Well, if you're going to say that Jesus is a son of God, not the son of God, you're saying he's a son of God, and you're saying that we're all equal with Jesus because we're all sons and daughters of God, you are doing what Satan told Eve in the garden, how they can be like God. And she fell for it. And because of that, we have sin on this earth. So the Mormons are teaching the same doctrine that Satan used in the very beginning as the serpent. He taught, oh, you can be like God if you just do this. And that's exactly what they're teaching. You know what? There's other religions teaching other things. And we won't go through all of them. But what I want you to get a grasp on is if you truly believe that God's word is true, and if you really believe that when you leave this earth that you are going to go to heaven and be with the Father. And if you really believe that Jesus would never lie. Then you'll believe John 14, 6 when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That means we need to be bold and stand up and not controversially. There's no reason to start a fight. Be confident in who you are and what you believe, but you don't have to whimper down and cry and walk off and say, oh, they wouldn't let me say this. You know what? In the power of Jesus Christ, you confess that he is God and let your friends and family know and ask them because why? Because if you don't, when you get to heaven and they're in hell, what a tragedy, especially if you didn't have anything to say to them about accepting Christ. And when that one young man died over here on the motorcycle crash or what, uh, that accident, all the Christian kids were so sad, but not one of them, not one had said to that man, a uh, young boy, do you know Jesus Christ? They've been going to school with him for years. And I know it's hard to do. 
But you know, if God is putting so much emphasis on if one person is saved, that there's a rejoicing in heaven, that you should leave the 99 and go find that one, then there is something special about a person that gets saved, even if it's just one. And that's why our events are so important. The events that we do when we go out and we evangelize, what's so important about that is that um, we aren't look. we'd love to have the multitude of people come up and get saved. But you know what? That may not be the case. It may be one. It may cost us $3,000 like it normally does to get one person to accept Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be dead straight, totally honest with you um, about this last event. I truly, honestly believe that on May 4th, 2013, that somebody accepted Jesus Christ out there that is going to um, do greater things than what we've done. And this is why. We were attacked spiritually, uh, physically in our ministry um, in ways that um, were not normal. We got attacked differently and strongly um, down to the wire, just down to the wire. And it was a different type of attack. So Satan has changed his tactics. But also, even up to today, we're still under attack um, from what we've done from the past. And it's, it's been over a week now. And we're still feeling that. And Satan is really, really angry. I, I, I can just tell you, as, um, as a pastor and seeing these events and um, the way that we've been able to work using the power of God and what he's doing in our ministry and to know that at every event we have these same kind of attacks, this one was different. And I don't know who the person is don't know why, don't know anything about it, but I will tell you, somebody got ex saved at that event, and I just really believe, um, yeah, maybe they won't be a Billy Graham or anything, um, I don't know, but I know somebody truly committed because of the kind of attacks this ministry has been under, and not by people outside, it's been spiritual attacks, and it's been craziness, and um, because of that, I truly believe that um, we answered God's call and did it, and we didn't have any excuses. Amen. And I'll close with this, is that the two type of faith, I want you to know that because a Christian, um, to be a Christian, you must have faith. But when you have that faith and you accept Christ in your life, we as a church need to have that next faith. We need to have the faith that produces works. We need to be out there praying for people. I, I, I heard this story today, and um, it really showed me how much spiritual uh, spiritual power you can have it was a great illustration i wish everyone could have heard it there was um and i, I said i was gonna close with this this, this story i'm closing with one of the other pastors for one of our other churches used to be like a, a real um, um troublemaker and he would carry a gun with him and he he didn't want anything to do with jesus and he went out and um they were out at this riverside river bed or whatever and um, there was this person laying down he was going to kill him and he pulled out a gun to put to their head um, the other two people that he was with took off. He put the gun to the head, and he heard a voice inside saying, um, kill him, kill him, kill him. Well, on the other thing, uh, he very, gets very upset with anybody telling him what to do. <laughs> and he said if Satan wouldn't have said it, he would have probably went ahead and killed him. But because Satan said it, he let the guy go. And he, he went ahead, and he walked out of the woods, and he left. When he got home about a week later, his, um, he has a, it's a pastor, is his uncle. And his uncle called him and said, I want to talk to you. He said, um, I know what you did out in the woods. And, I, 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 and he's like, his uncle's in a wheelchair. He's paralyzed in a wheelchair. There's no way that his uncle was out there. No way that he saw what was going on. And um, he's like, no, 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 no. He goes, don't give me all that. You don't know anything. He goes, I know that you were going to put a gun to somebody's head and you were going to kill him. But there was a voice inside your head that said, and when he said that, he just looked at him. He goes, I didn't tell anybody about that voice in my head. And he goes, because God has told me that there was a voice in your head saying, kill him, kill him, kill him. So he said, um, and I also want to tell you this. I want to tell you that you have two weeks. And that's what God told me to tell you, and I don't know anything else. So he says that he left, and he, he went home, and he's like, man, that, that, he goes, it did get his attention. He goes, I, I don't want anything to do with God. I don't want to have anything to do with God. I don't believe in this God stuff. But that thing about him knowing what was going on in my head, he goes, that did it. He goes, that maybe, and then he goes, I got two weeks. So he goes, the first week went by and it was okay. And then the second week started coming up. And so he called his uncle back and goes, hey, did God tell you anything else? 
He goes, no. So he went over and he saw his uncle. And he saw his uncle and he said, um, here's what happened. He started, the Holy Spirit started working on him and he started um, realizing that this was probably the end of his life. And that's what he really thought that, that two weeks meant. And the Holy Spirit started speaking to him and he started talking to his uncle and his uncle said that he had was just speaking and this conversation went on about an hour the uncle was reading out of the bible trying to teach him through the bible and he got up to um all the way through the bible just but in his head he was having these battles with um these voices that would say don't listen to this mess don't listen to that but yeah you need to accept this he said the best illustration he can talk about is like like, like a, a little angel on one side and a devil on the other side and they're just fighting it out and all he heard for that hour of uh, the the uh, his uncle being there and teaching trying to um, talk to him about jesus was he heard this battle going on and he finally and i'll just say it the way he said it he said you ever heard of the f word he said this is the way he accepted christ he said, um, I stood out of my chair and I just go, I don't care about the effing um, angel. I don't care about the effing devil. I don't care about the effing this and the effing that and the effing this. And he said he just knelt down on his, it knelt down in tears and just said, I just want God in my life. And he accepted Jesus Christ right there. And he said, I did it the, probably the way that no other person's ever done it in their life. But he goes, I accepted Jesus Christ right there and Jesus changed my life. And I thought during that story, and, and the whole salvation part's great. I love it. You know what? You will get that conviction in your heart, and you will come to Christ when God's calling you. And now he's a pastor right down the street here and, um, and, uh, and not out to kill people. Um, but here's the deal. That didn't get me. What I heard in that story was there is a pastor that goes to another church that God gave a vision to, and that vision was clear about what happened in his um, nephew's life. And that's what we're missing as a church. We are so comfortable in being a church, we're missing the gift. This, this pastor was given a vision, and if we just saw that vision, if we would just pray to God and say, you know what, it's through faith that you're going to show me and reveal these things to me. How amazing is that? What kind of powerful church would we be if we would just kneel down before God and say, God, I want more and more of what you have to offer?